this is Eric Miskell with EMS Now, and welcome to this edition of EMS Now Up Close. My pleasure today to speak with Mike Guzman, who's the EVP and COO of Benchmark Electronics. Benchmark, of course, is one of the large EMS companies in the world. Mike, welcome. I've never had an opportunity to interview you before, so I'm looking forward to this. But before we get into it, let me allow you the opportunity to introduce yourself and Benchmark to the audience. All right. Hey, thanks, Eric. And again, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you today in the audience. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Benchmark, you know, one of the one of the larger EMS companies, you know, out there in the world. Uh, we're headquartered. I'm actually in Tempe or Phoenix, Arizona, which is where our headquarters is at. Uh, you know, we're a public company traded on New York Stock Exchange. Um, you know, unlike a lot of the EMS companies, you know, we provide a pretty comprehensive set of solutions. Um, you know, we, we like to think that we provide uh, solutions across the entire product life cycle. You know, we lead with a lot of innovative technology, uh, including some kind of engineered solutions. You know, clearly a lot of focus on uh, engineering design for our partners. We have about 400 design engineers uh, across the world. Um, you know, and then again, we leverage, uh, you know, try to design an optimized global supply chain, you know, deliver world-class manufacturing. And, and maybe for your viewers to kind of frame it a bit, we focus on, you know, about a half dozen sectors, industries, you know, commercial, aerospace and defense, um, kind of next gen or really advanced computing solutions, uh, next gen telecom, like, you know, 5G, so on, photonic sort of technologies, uh, medical. And then uh, the other sectors we kind of play a lot in are real complex industrials. Think about mechatronics, automation, robotics. And finally, we have a, a pretty significant portion of our businesses over in the semiconductor uh, capital equipment space. And, you know, so by design, we're kind of focused on lower medium volume, you know, kind of higher complexity sorts of products. We talk a lot about, you know, we really like to partner in solutions when we say when it really matters. Um, and what we don't do is really high, high volume. You know, you're not going to see us building cell phones, things like that. So that's kind of the, the, the kind of framework that I'll be talking from today, if that helps. Good, good. And you, of course, have been in the industry for quite a few years. You know where a lot of the bodies are buried. So, <laughs> right. So you've been, we were reminiscing a little before this, but uh, so you've been in it for what, 20 years or so, I'm guessing. Yeah, actually, actually yeah, to your point, I joined, if I really go back and we were chatting earlier about the legacy of some of the companies who've been acquired, moved on, but I've been at it now for actually about 25 years um, yeah. in the enough space. Yeah, good. Well, I think you're then very well qualified to speak to the issue here. Um, and let me introduce that and then let's just kind of get in our conversation. Absolutely. The really issue is, is about OEMs diversifying their manufacturing footprint and how you're seeing a lot of corporations across the globe moving or making major investments in North American manufacturing. And uh, we've talked about, you know, there's issues like COVID and presidential administrations and orders kind of impacting this, but uh, maybe start there. Why don't we start with kind of how you view that general issue? And then we'll get into there's kind of six factors that sure. I know have that you think that are really driving this and we'll walk through those as well. But let's start there with kind of the general context. Yeah, I think great way to jump in. And you know, I when I really think back and look at I think the last certainly two years, but really probably the last four or five years, kind of been extraordinary times, you know, in, in the global marketplace. You know, and I, and I think there's been this convergence of events and almost this compounding of them on top of each other that are driving a lot of this dialogue around investments in North America, you know, U.S. manufacturing. You know, and you can kind of, not necessarily in a specific order, but, you know, you start with the last two uh, U.S. administrations, uh, current and the prior one. You know, uh, the administration, the presidents and the Congress, uh, you know, they've issued executive orders, they've passed laws that really are about you know, call it what you want, rebalancing global trade, you know, promoting the purchase of American made goods, mm -hmm. um, you know, with taxpayer dollars. So you got, you know, you got the GSA, the General Service Administration, you got the Trade Agreement Act, you know, the TAA, and then even more specifically, you know, the Buy America Act. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those things, you know, clearly have been significant changes from, you know, what was prior. You know, then you layer on that, that little thing called, you know, COVID, yeah. right? And, and what that's done. And you know, I think COVID by itself almost crippled the supply chain that was almost had become kind of just presumed of, I want to get material, I go do a mouse click and I'm going to get material. 
you know, so you layer on COVID and what it did to the supply chain. And then you layer on, I think the other maybe symptom that came out of COVID is what it's done to the kind of availability of labor um, around the globe and including the US. You know, so that's compounded it. And then you layer on logistics and freight costs and, you know, the ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal, messing up, you know, messing up trade for months. And I think all of those things, again, I think they, they, they kind of build on each other. Any one of them was pretty challenging, but that convergence of all of them kind of at the same time, I think has really caused a, kind of a sea change in strategy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. You you mentioned the uh, the Suez Canal. You know, I forgot about that. There's so yeah. many back to back to back that it's like, oh yeah, that happened too, right? So yep. uh, it's just been for, you're right for two three years, and there's been the kind of a rejuggling, and and then people start talking about supply chain security and those types of issues come up, and um, you know, I think COVID was a wake up call for a lot of people, and not just in the United States. I'd argue Europe too. Uh, you know, on kind of, you know, there's some dependencies there and wanting to, to restructure that. So yeah, I think, if, and I think, you know, it's interesting probably for a whole nother conversation, but I was, I was talking to a group of people last week and I think all those things we just talked about, you know, the whole world had gotten, again, very comfortable about continuity of supply and availability of supply. And, you know, it's a whole nother conversation around kind of just in time and did things get almost too leaned out? And, you know, there's probably an argument that lean's a wonderful thing. I'm a huge advocate that if you get too lean, you can't absorb those interrupts. And as you said, even a ship in the Suez Canal, was true, it was a significant interrupt. So, again, yeah, that's probably a whole other conversation for another day. Yeah. Now, well, I want to get to you've put together a, a, an interesting list of kind of six factors that you also think is driving the investment in manufacturing in North America. And I just want to kind of, you know, kind of step through them throughout the general issue and, and, and get your thoughts on it. The first one, which I really like, is, is that desire to reduce the distance between production and the customer. Yeah. Uh, speak to that one. Yeah, and, and again, I, I think, you know, part of that starts with service level of, you know, at the end of the day, we design something, we manufacture it, we get it to the market for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. And ultimately, that reason is to get it to the end customer. Right. And anything that can potentially interrupt that, that either availability or that time to service, right, um, is an opportunity. And I think clearly people are looking at now of how the supply chain resiliency, there's certain things you can do to help with that, you know, like add more material in, add more inventory. But there's a lot of inventory in play right now. But I think really physical distance matters, right? And then like say, if, we, if you don't have to go across multiple time zones, as you and I were talking about, if yeah. you don't have to go through multiple ports of entry, if you don't have to go through multiple global trade compliance requirements to get it from point of manufacture to point of consumption, I think that clearly now is becoming part of a, you know, whatever you want to call it, a total cost of ownership or a total value uh, approach. And we're seeing many of our, our partners, our OEMs who have products, starting to really place more value on that. Yeah. And, and related to that, of course, is, the, is another one, which is reducing the distance between engineering and manufacturing, which has different dynamics to it. Speak to that. Yeah. And, and that one, you know, I'm going to do a little bit of a, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that's one place where benchmarks in a really good position. Okay. We have engineering. I mentioned we have 400 design engineers. Okay. They're located across the globe. You know, they're in the U.S. There's a small group in Mexico. There's a group in, you know, a significant group in Europe. There's a group in Asia. And, and clearly now the time to market complexity, um, and especially the sectors we work in, you know, working in pretty complex sectors, that the ability to iterate rapidly and connect, not just it technically works because we designed it, but it's also producible. It's manufacturable. You know, the DFX is designed for manufacturability designed for supply chain is becoming a huge, huge issue now. And and when I say issue, opportunity. Done well during the design cycle, the time to market compresses. Done poorly, you may may have a design, the customer may wind up with a design that is technically works, Mm -hmm. but both from cost and maybe even more than cost, just availability of material, they can't get that product to the market. So, so, you know, I think any time that you have an engineering and a design team, eyeball to eyeball with a manufacturing team, it's going to be more effective. And we clearly are seeing that. I mean, significant change in behavior in our partners now with what they mm-hmm. desire from us. Yeah. 
No, that's an excellent point because, you know, in one of the past life, I worked for a rapid prototype shop, right? Yep. So I did book turn prototypes and, you know, engineers like to be in and see their babies come to life. They like to yep. interact with manufacturing because they're learning in the process as well. And so that uh, the proto and the NPI, especially, you know, instead of we're not sending people on airplanes across the planet anymore during COVID, right? People started adjusting that as well, I think. Right. We have, you know, again, I'll maybe rest just for a second, but we have a couple of customers now. We literally are co-located. It is a three-way solution. It's the customer mm -hmm. who's got, you know, kind of the idea and yeah. some of the, you know, the early stage, almost the, the early stage engineering team. Mm -hmm. but we have collated some of our manufacturing resources and some of our design engineering resources. So we're sitting there right in a physical building, the three of us together, bringing mm -hmm. extremely complex products to the market. And it's about cost, but it's more about time to market right now. So I think the how we work is starting to change on some of these complex engagements. No, yeah. no, that's very good. Now you touched on another one. Another one of the factors is uh, the gap in the cost of production between North America and, and, and Asia is certainly closing. You know, people used to ch chase that mythical dollar an hour in China rate that yeah. was never really there, but right, everybody yeah. was chasing it. But Speak to that one a bit. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things when, when we think about that, you know, clearly that, that labor arbitrage, you know, dynamic that you mentioned, you know, it's changing, right? And is, is it at par right now around the globe? No, you know, it's still there's deltas there, but, you know, it's shrinking. You know, it's that, that, that delta in labor rate is shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and by itself, that's a driver. But also when you look at a lot of the products out there now, you layer in kind of a total cost of ownership to land that product, get it back to our theme number one, get it to the customer. Okay, labor matters, always will, but then you layer in freight and logistics and all the inefficiencies of some of the time zones. And I think people are starting to get place more real value on what was always a cost that maybe they didn't comprehend. And so the labor compression, that delta compression, is certainly influencing things. And then I think just the total cost approach is also influencing things. And, you know, you know, the U.S. is under a lot of pressure. You know, we see it every day, right? You know, the, the scarcity of talent, you know, the workforce has been diminished quite a bit, but it's kind of a global phenomenon. We're seeing that in a lot of regions now. A lot of regions, even traditional low-cost regions, they're increasing their minimum wage rates, you know, mm -hmm. to bring their standard of living up. You know, so again, the dynamic, I think real simplistically by itself, the labor delta is not what it used to be, and I don't think it ever will be what it was 10 years ago. Right. You know, I, I did an interview uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, with some, some gentlemen in Europe about kind of the industry of their after supply, material supply chain, it's all about labor, right? Finding good people, finding, yep. having to import labor, you know, from other neighboring countries, right? So a yep. lot of challenges. So it, you're right. It's not just here. It's, it's there as well. And it's a supply demand, right? So as you're saying, Absolutely. going up. So yeah. Like, um, the other one is interesting to me, this next issue, which is uh, uh, responding to ESG concerns. Mm -hmm. That's becoming more important again, isn't it? Yeah, and I think, you know, back to again, maybe some of the biases or the movement back towards North America, it, clearly it's much more important. You know, probably used to be called CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, the banner now, ESG. Uh, and one, it's really critical. I mean, again, we as a company, extremely focused on our ESG journey, all right? And, you know, our, as a public company, our, our owners, our shareholders, extremely interested in, you know, are we, are we paying attention? You know, are we dotting the I's, crossing the T's around ESG? And, you know, part of it's a compliance conversation. You know, part of it's social. Are we taking care of the people? And then, you know, I'm going to come back to cost, even on the environmental side, right? You know, the real cost or the, the implications of not managing your carbon footprint obligations well, the implications of it takes, you know, container ships and airplanes to move things around, and what is the cost to that and the impact of the environment. Um, you know, those are real implications that are starting to impact people's decisions. You know, and then, you know, the other big part of ESG is on the social side is all the labor regulations, all right? And... You know, again, I'd say the world is probably behaving a little more responsibly across the globe, but we have to take care of our people and, you know, people are our most, most precious commodity in the equation. 
And, you know, again, I think one of the things in the U.S. and North America that some of our customers probably take some comfort in, public company, ESG, you know, kind of banner uh, and commitment, and then the scrutiny that goes with that, it lets them choose partners that they've got confidence in are going to represent them well when they go talk to their customers or their shareholders. So I think that's certainly part of the equation in play right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and this next one is interesting. The enhanced legal environment in North America is especially for IP protection. So that issue has certainly always been a concern and it's still there. Yeah, and I, and I like the way you said it. It's not new, it's always been there to your point. It's been talked about for, for, talked about for a long time. But again, I think a lot of these things, it's the, the optics are cranking up on them, you know, from people, right? And, yeah. you know, I think for a long time as well, we don't want steal, somebody stealing our design. You know, but it's probably getting larger than that now. You know, hardly a day goes by that you don't hear about something happening about IP, IP protection, or if I can go a little broader, blend in some of the cyber and cybersecurity and some of the attacks. And and again, you know, I think um, I, I think our partners are really looking for companies that they can be their trusted partner and ensure they're taking care of their IP, ensure they're taking care of their data ensure that they're going to be a robust, viable partner for them. So as you said, it's always been there. I just think that the scrutiny is cranking up significantly. No, absolutely. Um, and, the, and the last factor here is, is the changes to the Buy American, Buy American Act. Um, and you talk about it as, as far as incentivizing production of certain product categories. Um, speak to that one. And, and what are those categories? Yeah, you know, and I kind of I kind of alluded to that early on, you know, back to the administration. And, you know, again, their strategy has been to kind of rebalance global trade a bit. You know, so the, the General Services Administration, the GSA, clearly with the support of, you know, current president, prior president and Congress, you know, they have done a lot of things, all right, you know, around the, the Trade Agreement Act and now really specifically by America Act. So where that takes us when we're talking to our customers, it gets really complex, okay? Um, you know, we probably see three major groups of opportunity that that's setting off for us. And, and by the way, I didn't mention, you know, we as an EMS company, we have about, call it 180, 200 customers that we're working with, okay, between manufacturing and design. And, and I mentioned the number because with that number, we get a pretty broad exposure, okay, of what do customers desire, pretty good bread basket, if you will. And, and we almost put them into three buckets, all right? On these OEMs, looking at Buy American, you, 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 bucket one is kind of partners or companies or customers. They're already manufacturing in the US, all right? But, but they're seeing an increase in demand now driven by the Buy America sort of strategy, okay? You know, government procurement saying, I need more stuff, okay? That's got American content. And so those companies are, they already kind of have partners here but they're looking now for probably more capability and more capacity, okay? But they kind of mentally already crossed the bridge of I have a, I have a US or I have an American build strategy, okay? Um, and we're clearly seeing a lot of that. You know, the second one is um, companies who don't really um, have a, an infrastructure in the US today, okay? But they're going, wow, one of my biggest customers and customers happens to fall into this GSA space, you know, government space. Mm -hmm. And if I want to play there, okay, if I want to get into that or sustain that space or maybe get into it, I've got to have a presence in the U.S., okay? I need a U.S. manufacturing option. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and those customers, you know, we kind of, we work with them to educate, you know, how, why, where, you know, we can do that. And then, you know, the other ones, um, the other one is the third bucket is companies that they've probably had a long, long relationship directly with the U.S. government, and now they're really, really looking to manufacture, uh, manufacture their products specifically for government customers in the U.S. And, and, and they may not go all into the U.S. They maybe just need they want to keep the rest of the global footprint they have, but now they need the U.S. partner presence, you know, to support mm -hmm. this. So you know that's kind of how we see it the three major buckets of customers that are looking for a solution here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting with that one because another trend I'm noticing in the industry over the last year plus now is EMS, it used to be U.S.-based EMS were doing the M&A activity and buying other in the world. It's right. around now, right? We're seeing European and Asian companies coming over and acquiring here in order to yeah. 
position themselves here. Yeah, yeah, so actually European and, and European and Asian, to your point, I mean, kind of the rest of the world, right? You know, kind of trying to pick up a US presence. Yeah. You know, and again, one of the things, one of the big things we have at Benchmark is, you know, good strategy, good fortune. Um, we kept a pretty balanced footprint over the last 20 years. You know, if you look at our global footprint, you know, we're on seven, you know, seven countries, about 20 manufacturing sites, but our footprint, um, and this is part of what we bring to our customers and it's helping us now. We're, you know, kind of about a 40%, 40%, you know, 40% um, Americas, 40% Asia, 20% Europe footprint. So, you know, we've got a strong presence here in the U.S. and it candidly is playing to our favor right now, you know, for the, for the kind of customers we just talked about. They need a U.S. presence. They don't want to do it with a small shop. They'd like somebody that has a global presence. They'd like somebody that they get the U.S. plus the rest of the world with one engagement. And again, it's really playing to our favor right now. Yeah. Now, I like the list of six, but after, because um, I think you can't really argue with those. Um, but what about the supply base, supply base being mostly resident in Asia still? Yeah. You know, manufacturing's here, but all... 90 percent 80 whatever that percentage is of the componentry that we're doing is still being made out of asia do you see that changing how do you see that impacting this yeah, yeah well, clearly we see it changing and again you know not meant to be a tutorial on you know buy america today or even right. quite honestly on uh, taa but you know it's all about content and and and, and value add right so you know you get the manufacturing into the us that helps you know the value add the labor is us um, but candidly, a lot of the time you've got to get some of the supply chain over resource to the U.S. to just to get to the criteria. Yeah. Um, so, so that so that's a forcing function. To your point, I mean the other forcing function, people get more and more worried about continuity of supply. Okay, so so we're seeing it. Um, we are very actively working with um, with the customers we have on resourcing where possible. All right, and not everything. Mean, there's some things that they are. I mean, you can take China and the, you know, the kind of the, the stranglehold they have in a lot of the, you know, the fab between uh, China and Taiwan. Yep. Um, it's going to take a while to rebalance that, right? You know, the infrastructure builds and so on. There's companies starting to do it, but it's going to take a while. Um, you've got things over in, you know, kind of the unfortunate situation and tragic situation, Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got metals, you've got certain alloys, you've got things like neon gas. They're very some things are very difficult, if not almost impossible to resource. So what we're doing is where possible, we're guiding our customers to alternate solutions. And that's a big part of what our design teams are spending their time and our global supply chain doing, are doing right now is, okay, you know, partner, customer, you have a design, your AVL looks like this, there are alternates and where there's alternates, let us help you map over to them. Thank you. But it is not binary, and I don't candidly. There's some things I just don't think are probably solvable, and then yeah. you have to take a different supply chain risk mitigation strategy on the things that you can't, you know, pivot with time. Yeah, because it's been interesting the conversation of all the fabs, the semiconductor coming over, but then for the packaging and the PCB boards, right? Yeah. That's all Asia still. So yeah. we manufacture them here, but. Are we going to have to ship back for packaging over in Asia then, in order and then bring them back? Yeah, you know. So I, you're right. I think a lot of these things need to be worked out, and but at least we're in the beginning of a trend here. It, it is. I think we're beginning to try to think. You know, like most things, the first thing is, are we aware <laughs> that there's a challenge? And I think there's certainly awareness. You know, as we said over the last couple of years. Yeah. yeah I think the other thing that we're starting to really get into is sometimes it's not that first level supply that's the problem, the challenge. It's, you know, what we would tend to say the second or third tier suppliers. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at where some of like that resins come from, chemical factories are located, and you can even move where you're going to assemble a connector, for example. Mm -hmm. But the resins and the things that are at the core of that connector, that's really hard. That takes longer to change that. Yeah. So I think awareness is there. I think there's certain, we've had customers tell us that look, for the first time, um, to highly regulated industry, they're very, very slow to change. I was with the customer two weeks ago and I said, look, we've told you no for 20 years about alternate sources. We're ready to listen. We're ready to talk. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so def uh, definitely a trend. Things are moving. People are into What could potentially derail it, do you think? Well, you know, I think what we don't know 
is yeah. what we don't know, all right? And, you know, again, another ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal. I mean, quite honestly, the Russia-Ukraine thing already alluded to a terrible situation. Um, didn't see that coming, okay? And, you know, major geopolitical events absolutely could derail what we think the right strategies are and what the right solutions are. And, you know, I think, I think over time, you know, the, the winners in this thing are going to be the ones who are, you can't anticipate everything, but the ones who maybe don't fight change because things will change, priorities will change. And, and I think it's going to take nimble and agile kind of mindsets and solutions to really, really, really navigate this because I, my personal opinion, even if it's perfect today, and maybe we, you, whoever we are, has yeah. the perfect solution designed, it's not going to be perfect in six months or 12 months because something will change in this ecosystem. And then can we adjust to that? I think those are going to be the winners over time. Yeah. Excellent. Mike, this has been fantastic. I really appreciated your thoughts, your insights and comments on this. Um, you know, it'll be an interesting trend to continue to watch over the coming years. Um, people always spoke about the roaring 20s as we headed into this decade again, right? For manufacturing and uh, it seems like we're there and uh, lots is happening. So, and we'll be keeping an eye on benchmark, but I appreciate your thoughts today. Thank you very much for your time and maybe we get a chance to catch up again another time in the future. All right, Eric, my pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir.